Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Church on Main, no PM. Uh, thanks for being with us. If you're online, um, it's great to have you. Um, yeah, and just my first hope and prayer this evening is that the Lord would speak to each of you as I hope that He speaks to each of us who are here at the mill. Uh, this is my first time back at the mill in four, four or five months, um, and it's been really exciting to, to be back here. Great to see some of the faces who've been helping put on this show um, and yeah, just see uh, members of our community uh, again after a long period of time. So I'll run quickly through the announcements for this evening and then open in prayer. Then I'll ask Megan uh, Hawkins to, sorry, <laughs> Megan Hitchcock to, to, uh, to come and do the reading for us. So the first announcement is that, um, just a reminder about tithes and offerings. Uh, we can still in this time offer our tithes and offerings to the church um, via EFT, um, and the details for that are on the Church on Main website. Um, the second announcement is that the COVID relief fund is still going. Um, and one initiative which is helping to uh, contribute to that relief fund, which aims to serve members of our community who are in need, is on Friday nights, uh, the Mill Cafe has been making pizzas which are for sale. Um, so please, uh, yeah, take, take advantage of that and yeah, just let's be a community. Um, I've had them myself and can recommend them. Uh, so yeah, Friday nights, remember that. This coming Wednesday, we have All Leaders. All Leaders has been quite strange in this time of uh, social distancing and lockdown. And this coming Wednesday, we're doing, um, I think it's called an All Leaders drive through So if you're part of All Leaders, just please keep checking your emails and more information for how that will work um, will be sent to you, I'm sure, during the week. As always, we have uh, a Zoom hangout after the service. So please don't uh, rush off after you finish watching this YouTube live stream, but rather join the Zoom hangout, which uh, you'll find the link to if you're on the Church on Main Mill PM website, just below the actual video that you're currently watching. Um, else, if you're watching it on YouTube, you can go to the churchonmain.org.za website and you'll find the link there. And then finally, let's keep as a community praying for the members of our community, our friends who have unfortunately contracted COVID-19. Um, let's keep trusting the Lord that he will see us through this time and um, just uplifting uh, our friends in prayer. Um, and then lastly, we need help. Everything that you can see here, um, a group of people have kindly volunteered uh, often uh, to to set this up and run it on Sunday night. So if you're interested at all in helping run this, specifically with regards to the camera and photography aspects, uh, please get in contact uh, with us um, and you will have the opportunity for, for training in all the aspects that you will need to help set up these live Sunday nights. Um, this is kind of an open invite for as long as this period um, of uh, COVID-19 and the lockdown continues, but specifically we're needing help for August and September. So if you are interested and available in those months, please contact us as soon as you can. I'll just now open the service in prayer and ask Megan to come up. Lord God, thank you for your constancy, Lord, in this time of upheaval, in this time where the world seems different every day, Lord, and there's so much uncertainty. Thank you that you are our firm foundation, our rock, the one who is unchanging, who's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, Lord. Thank you that you look after us. Thank you that you are constant in your protection of us. Father, we, we come to you tonight and ask you please to speak to us. Um, help us to set our hearts and our minds on you, Lord, um, and help us to hear your voice. Uh, Lord, be with us tonight. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Megan, you can come up. Um, the reading this evening is taken from John chapter 8, verse 1. Then they all went home, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery, they made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, 
this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus went down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard him began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left, with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin.
Christ is risen from the grave. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. While I was a slave to sin, 
Jesus died for. Thank you so much to the band for leading us in worship. Uh, let me close and pray for us. Please let everyone close their eyes in your lounge. Um, Lord, thank you so much that we get together still uh, virtually, that some of us get to come uh, to the church building and to actually uh, be together where normally we wouldn't. Uh, thank you that we get to worship you and we get to grapple with the things that is happening in the world and we get to see how Jesus leads us uh, to not only um, live more like he called us to, but to solve the problems, Lord. Uh, thank you, Jesus, that you are gracious, that you are forgiving, that you are loving, that you are just, that you um, do not lower the standard, Lord. Um, and will you please bless me as I uh, try and expound your word and teach us um, what you call us to, Lord, uh, to try and solve some of the problems in our uh, uh, world. Amen. Thanks, guys. Um, so, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Mikhail Manuel, uh, and I'm actually going to make this a bit higher, sorry. Um, and I've been here once before. <clears throat> uh, I think I hosted a couple of weeks ago. Um, and what's the nice thing about the way we do things at Church on Main is that every now and again someone else gets a chance to preach. I told a close friend of mine um, that... Uh, I'll be preaching this weekend, and she was quite flabbergasted by the idea that, that someone who's not a full-time pastor would be preaching. Um, but of course, that does allow us the opportunity to have a whole range of people uh, giving input and allows us as a church to kind of grapple a bit more with what it means to follow Jesus and hopefully get close to the truth in that way. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to just go through the scripture one more time before I start out. Um, so Megan read uh, John 8, verse 1 to 11 for us, and I'm going to uh, read it again just for us one more time. Uh, they went each to his own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple. All the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. 
The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, so that, uh, sorry, so what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground, and as they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground, but, they, but when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, uh, and, sorry, beginning with the old. Yeah, being with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with a woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Uh, go and from now, uh, from now on sin no more. Um, so I think that the scripture has a lot in it. Uh, of course, there are questions around uh, what was Jesus writing in the sand. Uh, there's questions around how he prioritized going to the temple and the Pharisees met him there. Uh, there really is a lot to be uh, learned here and, and taught here. But what I want us to focus on is uh, race relations. Uh, it is something that is very close to my heart. It's something that I, I really, really uh, want to see solved in our country, in our city, in our world. Uh, and of course, it's something that has been at the tip of our tongues for the last uh, month or two with the Black Lives Matter protests, but also with what we've been grappling with as a church uh, right here in, in, in Mill PM. Um, so just, I've got the, my sermon is separated into three sections. First is what I call the setup. Uh, then it is the scripture, and then it is what I think this means for us. So. Quickly, in terms of the setup, um, I think that uh, by now, <laughs> through all of the hundreds of years, by now we have to all agree, and we do all agree, that there's been centuries of race-based uh, injustices that have been carried out across the world uh, for hundreds of years at the hands of people who are white. Um, that's not to say that all white people have been doing that, but certainly the governments that have been carrying it out um, and the people that have been carrying it out have been white. This has resulted in a, a society both in our country and uh, worldwide that is actually, um, that has racism deeply entrenched within it. Um, and, and it is something that I've grappled with a lot because there are questions around what is racism and what is prejudice? When are you being racist and when is it a, a, a function of, of uh, race-based privilege? Um, and so I think that with all of my grapplings, I've come to a point where I now uh, believe and agree that uh, racism is in fact systemic um, and that uh, a privilege as well does exist, where previously I didn't think that it did. Um, I've got two stories from my own personal life to share, which I uh, believe show us that racism <coughs> is in fact, or systemic racism exists and that privilege exists. The first one uh, is quite recent. I have some friends that live in Seapoint and I went to visit them a couple of weeks ago, I can't remember when. Uh, and as I had gotten to the flat, I had my bag and I was tired because I'd come from somewhere far away. And I, uh, my phone had died and I totally forgot about you know, which flat they were in. And so I kind of tried a couple of buzzers, tried a couple of buzzers and couldn't figure out um, which it actually was. Uh, but eventually someone walked to the gate and they opened the gate and uh, they let me in, so which is quite nice of them. And I got to the second sort of foyer between two glass doors. Um, if you guys were here, you'd see that the people watching me right now are laughing because they, they see where the story is going. Um, so between two glass doors, I um, then had to try and ring the buzzer again. Didn't know what the flat number was, so was lost, as lost as I was when I was outside. Um, and this young uh, white woman walked, she was on her way for a run, so she walked out, opened the door, and she kind of looked at me, and the first thing I said was, was I, I know this looks weird, um, but my friends live here, I promise, uh, and if anything bad happens, you are welcome to blame it on me. Um, and so in that moment was when I uh, realized that this is an example of how I submitted myself to the racist ideas that a man who is colored and who's trying to get into a building uh, without having any of the right, um, I suppose, the right like permissions, I guess, um, or the right knowledge, uh, is likely to be assumed to be a criminal of some sort. Now, 
I think it is rational for anyone who really tries to enter a building without, with a dead phone and, and buttons that don't work, for someone to assume that this person might not uh, have to be here, uh, and it could be untoward, but there is a skewed idea that uh, people who are colored or people who are black are likely to, to do that kind of thing. Um, the second story that I, I uh, have is about a time when I was in Woolworths, and it's actually happened a couple of times, and I know a number of uh, friends who are, uh, I think they're black, um, who've had a similar experience. So you're wearing your ordinary clothes and you're walking around the store, uh, and at some point someone comes along to you uh, and they ask you, do you work here? Uh, and so I've had that, exp I've made the mistake a couple times myself, and as a result, I've become very paranoid about looking on people's sort of shirt to sort of see a name badge of some sort. Um, but nonetheless, I've been asked a number of times, do you work here? And when I've asked some of my white friends if they've had similar experiences, all of them across the board say they haven't. Um, and so it's, it's, not less, it's not less demeaning to be a, a, to work in a Woolworth store or whatever, but the idea again is there that the people that work in a Woolworth store are, are more likely to be colored, uh, and therefore we see some kind of racial undertones that are, are, are at play there. And I think that this points us to what uh, privilege is, or what systemic racism is. Um, on the one hand, it could be that institutions decide to only hire people of a certain color, but in our country, that's not the case because we have uh, race laws, race-based laws that that um, favor people who are black or, or white, black or colored, sorry. Um, but on the other hand, it's something that is difficult to describe. It's something that is that is kind of there, but you can't really ever put your finger on it, and it's really difficult to put words to it. Um, and I had a chat with a friend of mine who is studying at UCT, and he agrees with me as well. Eventually the race-based debate gets to a point where you can't really pinpoint what it is. It's no longer an act, it rather seems to be some kind of uh, naturalized uh, cultural assumptions about certain people and then that affects the way that you interact with other people. I think we saw it in the way that I interacted with a young uh, a white lady in Seapoint, and we certainly also saw it in the way that an older white woman interacted with me uh, in Woolworths white man, can't remember the gender of the person. Um, so, so out of this thing, to try and address this uh, systemic racial injustice that we see in our everyday lives that so many people experience, that especially people of color experience, um, that really breaks people's hearts because it suggests that they are not equal in society and it really goes against the grain of everything that the Lord uh, teaches us about how we should view ourselves and, and, and what he thinks of us. Um, people have responded with mass movements. Uh, it started way back in 1967. That was the first time that the idea of privilege came about. Um, of course, we've seen black consciousness, we've seen the Black Panthers, we've seen um, a whole bunch of anti-apartheid movements. We've also now, today, seen the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, I am both uh, pro what they stand for and I am anti parts of what the movement stands for. But nonetheless, what we have also seen uh, is the uh, creation of two new popular culture terms. It is virtue signaling and cancel culture. And I thought it would be good to reference these two things in this, from the scripture because I think that it shows us uh, how it is being uh, um, carried out, but at the same time because I had a conversation with uh, some of the leaders at our church that they didn't know what cancel culture was. Um, and so I thought it would be really good for us to actually touch on these things since it is the popular culture things that's going on, but at the same time it is deeply, deeply problematic. <clears throat> so. Quickly, virtue signaling, virtue signaling uh, is an action or a practice of publicly expressing an opinion or a sentiment intended to, intended to demonstrate one's good character or the moral correctness of one's position on a particular issue. So that's not a new idea. Essentially, it's a version of self-righteousness, but it's, it's self-righteousness where you're acting it out or speaking it out. Um, so virtue signaling is not new, but it's given this new trendy academic term to, to uh, better articulate what's happening in society. And the second phrase is cancel culture. Um, there are other words uh, like something shaming and uh, shaming culture or something like that, but there are other ways to say this. Um, 
what cancel culture is what I'm going for. And cancel culture is a form of boycott in which someone who has performed an act that is considered a violation of today's social justice norms, even if it happened a long time ago, is thrust out of social or professional circles and it often happens online. An example of this is when a young South African white woman was running uh, for what was she running for, Miss World or Miss South Africa or something like that. And there's something that she said when she was 14 or 13 years old, she's now in her 20s, and that thing has come back to haunt her. Um, every time I post on Facebook, I'm a little bit scared that um, someone along the way, 20 years from now, is not going to agree with what I've just said, and they're going to come after me for it. Um, I guess that is why we need to be very careful with social media. Um, but these two ideas now exist. We see them creeping into our university campus campuses. We see them creeping into our social media conversations and into even our everyday conversations, um, where you now have one group of people that are allowed to say things, another group of people that aren't. And unless you agree with the one, agrees with the other. Therefore, this is not going to, that sort of uh, um, idea is not going to be allowed in that particular context. So. So with these two ideas in place, I want to suggest what I think is potentially a slightly controversial idea or slightly new idea. And that is uh, summed up in this scripture here where Jesus says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. But also it's summed up in what's called the doctrine of total depravity, which means that all human beings are fallen. Uh, everyone falls short of what God wants us, uh, how God wants us to live and how he wants us to be obedient of him. Um, <clears throat> and it's only by his grace that we are able to actually do good, uh, that we're actually able to live up to what he um, calls us to, but even then we will still fall short. Um, so with that in mind, if racism is systemic, which I believe it is, and if privilege exists, which I believe it does, then for that system to be sustained, no one can be not racist in that system. Everyone has to either perpetuate the system in some way or, or uh, what's the other word I got you, reinforce the system in some way. If people begin to act against that system, then the systemic nature of racism will eventually uh, erode, and that's what we want, right? But we cannot place one type of racism with another type of racism, with another prejudice for one group, with a prejudice for a different group, because that is just replacing racism with racism. Um, but I believe, and I hold, and I think the Bible teaches us, that uh, we in fact are all fallen and therefore we are all racist. Um, now when I, I read the story that we've got here in John 8, what I picture happening in today's um, uh, context is I see uh, someone of color or someone who's marginalized um, dragging a person who is white or someone who has been deemed to have privilege in front of Jesus and telling them this person here uh, has been uh, has maligned me in some way by virtue of having a different opinion to me or by virtue of the color of their skin or by virtue of their gender or their sexual orientation or things like that. That's what I see happening more and more and more and more in our society. People dragging Jesus in front of, dragging people uh, in front of Jesus to say, this person has done bad, what are you going to do about it? Um, and it is because we all across the board agree that racism is wrong, um, but I don't think that any of us are actually uh, blameless or not guilty or immune in some way to actually uh, not be racist. I'm going to use my same two stories to demonstrate that fact. Firstly, with the Seapoint story, um, when I, a colored man, uh, immediately adopted the at least subconscious mental position of saying I probably look like a criminal in this scenario, so I need to explain the situation away. Um, I reinforced the system. Um, when I, in that very same light, assumed that this young uh, lady, who I have no idea what actually thought in that moment, and who actual fact, in, in actual fact, opened the door and said, "Okay," and kind of you know let me go through, um, I immediately assumed that she might just uh, have racist ideas about the situation. Um, um, uh, so I uh, uh, reduced her to being racist. Um, there again, I reinforced the system. Um, in the Woolworth story, as soon as uh, the white lady came up to me or the white gentleman came up to me and said, do you work here? They immediately reinforced the idea that generally colored people are going to be working in these positions. Um, so again, here is a white person reinforcing that system. And so I really think that our conclusion from that uh, is that 
uh, actually we are all fallen, actually we are all at fault. Um, and so to now attempt to virtue signal as though those that are uh, not white uh, are actually never at fault and those that are white are always at fault um, as uh, I know that there are some books that have been written about this, uh, they try to suggest that that's the case, um, is, is not only far from the truth but it's actually also utterly unhelpful. Um, so I think that this scripture over here, I actually titled this preach, uh, We Have Hope, uh, How the Gospel Can Help Us to Overcome Systemic Racism. I think that this scripture here teaches us three core ideas um, which can actually get us to overcome how systemic racism is eroding and destroying our society. The first one, well, the first thing we're going to do is look at the scripture. So I think the first interesting thing here is we need to know what Moses said about adultery, and we need to know what Jesus said about adultery. So to recap, the Pharisees pull a woman who has been involved in an adulterous situation in front of Jesus and says, what do you do? Jesus says to them, if you are without sin, you can stone her first. They then leave one by one, starting with the oldest towards the youngest. Um, and then eventually they're all gone, and the woman then uh, is left alone. <clears throat> and Jesus says to her, uh, no one here has condemned you, so I won't condemn you either. Uh, go, uh, go now and sin no more. Very important, that last part. So what does Moses uh, say about adultery? So we're going to just turn that around a little bit, and, and if you have a Bible with you uh, at home in front of your TV or your computer, then please turn with me. So Leviticus 20, verse 10, it says, If a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. What does Jesus say about adultery? Matthew 5, verse 27 to 28. You have heard that it was said, <clears throat> You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So the first outworking of this is that the Pharisees applied the law incorrectly. They attempt to bring this adulterous woman in front of Jesus to say she has done wrong in terms, of the law of the Moses, in terms of the law of Moses, which I think is a form of virtue signaling, by saying that that person is wrong without actually saying how you are wrong and how you have acknowledging your own faults. Uh, I think that that is to try and puff yourself up in some way and therefore and thereby a virtue signal, or signal your virtue. But in this case, they applied the law incorrectly. Because if she really was uh, in an act of adultery, then in that situation there has to have been another man, and maybe even a woman and a woman, I don't know, um, or at least a man and a woman. But why did the Pharisees not bring the man as well? Uh, if they were so uh, concerned with uh, uh, upholding and maintaining the law of Moses, but in fact, they were applying it incorrectly. The second thing is then we move on and we see that Jesus speaks to the Pharisees. Uh, he says, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. So now uh, we read, we turn to Matthew 7, uh, verse 1 to 5. And Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is, your, uh, that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Now, what I think is profound about this is that Jesus... Uh, uh, doesn't, at this point at least, doesn't change the nature of the law. He doesn't change the nature of what is just and right here. Um, we know that uh, the marriage bed is sacred. We know that marriage uh, is a form of, um, like a foreshadowing of what it is like between Jesus and the church. Um, and so we know that adultery is an egregious sin, which actually, uh, before Jesus' time, the punishment was death. Um, but it doesn't change that law because now we see someone who's actually doing it. Instead, what it does is he walks the fine line to say that if you're going to judge people, you yourself need to make sure that you're without sin as well. And so he doesn't just call us uh, to, to uh, ensure or uphold justice in society, but he actually calls us ourselves to act justly and us ourselves not to sin. And he actually, like, 
he raises the bar, which we already see in the way that he talks about adultery in, verse, in, in Matthew 5, but we see it here as well in the way that he responds to the Pharisees. Jesus raises the bar. Um, and then the last thing that he does is Jesus speaks to the woman, and he says, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no, Lord. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go from, go, and from now on sin no more. So we already know that he upholds the law uh, in terms of the way that he act, interacts with the Pharisees, but now he also upholds the law in terms of the way that he interacts with the woman uh, because he tells her to sin no more. He doesn't say that it's okay and, you know, go and do you, boo. Uh, he, he says, don't sin anymore. Be better in this regard. Um, what you've done is wrong, but I will not condemn you. The only person that can condemn the woman in this case is, in fact, Jesus, because he's the only person um, that uh, uh, is, is without fault, that is without sin, uh, who can search himself and know that the same judgment can be applied to him, and he will not fall short of that judgment. Um, and yet he says, I will not condemn you, but he also doesn't say, it's okay. He says, don't sin anymore. Uh, he upholds the law. And then, of course, he also shows her grace by saying, I don't condemn you either. He's the only person who can condemn her, and yet he doesn't. So in light of this, in light of what I've called the setup and how I think uh, our race relations or our decades or centuries of injustice has affected uh, the way that our society interacts with each other today and the way that... Um, uh, racism is systemic and the way that privilege is everywhere and in every single interaction. Um, and then in light of the scripture, what does this mean for the way that we actually address this issue or, or, or uh, overcome the problem or solve the problem or even interact with each other uh, right from this point onwards? I think before I go on, at this stage, it's perhaps helpful to actually note that this type of systemic issues is not only about racism. Uh, it's actually, uh, it exists everywhere where there is difference. So if you are a man and a woman, there are gender issues that we can talk about. If you are uh, homosexual or heterosexual, uh, there are sexuality issues that we can talk about. Um, if you are rich or poor, there are class issues that we can talk about. If you have one ideology or different ideology, there are ideological issues that we can talk about. Um, but the place that we see it most prominent in people actually gaining ground and fixing the problem is in fact in race issues. So I think we can use that as the starting point and then please do apply this to everything else and hopefully we can get to a place where we can actually live together harmoniously in the way that the Lord intended. So the first thing I think that we see I think what this means for us is that we must know, and we must know confidently, that God hates injustice. Uh, he tells us in Matthew 22 that we must love God uh, first and foremost. I am paraphrasing, so let me just get it right. Um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Um, God wants us to treat each other the way that we'll treat ourselves. Uh, if we know what love feels like and looks like because we've experienced it, then to not treat someone else like that is to fall short of what God calls us to. Um, he hates injustice when it is in relation to someone else. He also hates injustice when it is in relation to himself because he calls us to love him above everything else and calls us to obey him above everything else. And we see it right in the beginning in Genesis with the fall. Um, and uh, we see it throughout the whole Bible that God is not stoked when we um, disobey him and actually carry out injustice in relation to him. Um, if we're going to look at race relations more specifically, we can go to Revelation 7 verse 9, where there's a vision uh, that is shared here, and it says, After this I have looked, and behold, a great, after this I looked and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. So the vision that this, that this person had that then went on to, to record it in Revelation is of one where people with our differences um, 
actually worship God together, which literally just reinforces the idea that we ought to love each other the way that we love ourselves, and we ought to love God uh, first and foremost, which I think is part of what Anne-Marie actually tried to teach us two weeks ago, or three weeks ago. Um, so that's the first thing we must uh, uh, remember from this. God hates injustice. He doesn't, uh, Jesus doesn't reduce uh, the level that is required of, of the way that we interact with our husbands or wives. Um, he, he, uh, adultery is still really bad. In fact, he raises the bar by saying that even if you look at a woman incorrectly, and I suppose if you are a woman, if you look at a man incorrectly, then you are being adulterous. Uh, he hates injustice. The second thing, um, is that Jesus doesn't lower the standard of injustice. Uh, as I just ex explained now, um, just because people around us are actually sinning or doing the things. Matthew Henry uh, describes in his commentary that part of the reason why Jesus said, uh, let him who is without sin um, among you be first to throw a stone at her, uh, Matthew Henry says that during the time, a lot of the Pharisees were actually involved in adulterous uh, 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 environments and, and, and relationships, I suppose. Um, and so they themselves were, you know, carrying out the sin that they were accusing this woman of. Um, so just because everyone around uh, uh, society at that time were, in fact, uh, you know, being adulterous doesn't mean that Jesus now says, oh, it's okay. Um, and also, just because people are now complaining about it, Jesus doesn't say to the people who are committing the adultery, oh, it's okay. Uh, I know that you've fallen. I know that you're going to struggle. He maintains the standard. Uh, he maintains the standard of saying adultery is wrong as well as you must be without sin. Um, and in relation to racism, we can't now want to change the uh, definitions of racism uh, because we you know, like the idea of marginalized people being uh, um, the ones that now have the moral power. I read an article uh, in preparation for this in the Gospel Coalition, um, and you can look it up. I actually don't remember what it's called. Something about white fragility. So you, you can look it up and you, you'll see what it says. But essentially, the author says that, that for people who haven't had um, the moral high ground uh, for centuries, um, for them to now have the moral high ground, it is very, very tempting to actually want to hold that high ground regardless of anything else. Um, but in actual fact, uh, we can't do that. We have to hold the idea uh, that we are all fallen, uh, we all fall short, we all in some way are, are reinforcing or perpetuating the systemic racism um, by virtue of the way that we interact or the way that we even think about things because that informs our actions. So Jesus doesn't uh, change the level of justice. He actually raises it. We should ourselves also not change uh, the fact that racism is bad and it is wrong. Um, um, Yes, that is all for number two. The third one that I think Jesus shows us is that he shows us grace. Uh, and so we must show people grace as well. Perhaps you are sitting at home and you are black or colored and you feel like you have been um, the receiver of some of the, of some of the uh, systemic, systemic, racist, systemic racism issues <laughs> in society. Um, uh, it's so quick and easy to actually cancel somebody. And this is where cancel culture comes in. It's so quick and easy to actually, uh, uh, you know, tell someone who doesn't agree with you, who doesn't see that racism is systemic, or who doesn't uh, agree with the fact that you believe that in a particular situation you were treated badly. It's so quick and easy to actually tell that person that you cannot have an opinion in this matter because you are white, or you cannot have an opinion in this matter because you are male. Uh, I don't know if this perhaps sounds strange to anyone, but at our university campuses, it's happening all the time. Um, if you don't hold the popular opinion on a particular matter, then you are no longer allowed to have an opinion. Um, and that is the very opposite of grace. In fact, what Jesus does here instead is he's the only one who can condemn her. He's the only one who is without sin, um, and he doesn't. Uh, he doesn't condemn her. In, instead, he tells her to carry on with life, but to sin no more. And that's exactly the kind of response that we should have uh, to racist issues. In the particular moment where we see racism carrying on, being carried out, we should uh, have the confidence to say, this is wrong. God hates it. I hate it uh, as a result of that. Um, but, um, you know, keep going on with life, but just stop being racist or stop actually with those actions. We cannot be canceling people because we don't like what they say. 
Um, then the last thing, and I think that this is the most important thing, actually, that I think that uh, um, it's perhaps not something that Jesus is teaching us here, to be honest, but I think it's actually just a helpful way uh, to move forward, and that is actually that we must not be scared. Actually, Jesus does do that. Let me rephrase that. Uh, we mustn't be scared. Because Jesus here goes to the Pharisees um, who hold the power uh, in that point in time, and he challenges them. Uh, he also uh, says to this woman uh, that she's not condemned, that she can carry on, and so therefore actually, you know, at face value goes against the very thing that the Pharisees are trying to uphold. Um, but in actual fact, all he's doing is, is applying a higher standard. So we mustn't be scared to have the difficult conversations. Uh, maybe to put it in a pop culture type phrase, I asked my friends this earlier, but I've they didn't know who said it, but there's a phrase that says, don't be scared. And essentially, it's like, a, it's like a cool way of saying, like, just do the thing that you need to do. Have the difficult conversation. Um, and I actually think that as the church body, as those that believe in Jesus, we have the responsibility to have the difficult conversations. We're the only ones that I'm aware of that is taught to walk this really fine line of both uh, um, maligning injustice and racism and saying uh, that, that we still accept you. This is still a space where you can grapple with those issues. Uh, so we have to have those conversations and we must be the ones to really give people a space where they can be heard out. Uh, and I'm not sure how many people actually are aware of this, but the Mul PM leadership team have had two such conversations already amongst ourselves. Um, and so if you are in a home group or if you're just you know, in your workspace, uh, please do feel encouraged that the leaders of the site are having these difficult conversations. We aren't scared. Um, and that God really calls us to address injustices and to actually show people grace without lowering the standard uh, of what he calls us to do and live by um, and what he saves us to do and who he says that we are. Um, so I think that this scripture really shows us um, how we can interact with this time of so much racial injustice, um, so much deeply entrenched uh, or so many deeply entrenched issues that come from centuries of laws that have really uh, um, deprived people of the dignity of feeling human. Um, we can fix those things. I really do believe that we have hope, that we have got hope, um, but it will take very, very difficult conversations and a courageousness of not being scared. Um, so on that note, I'm going to pray for us, um, and then that'll be... Uh, the end from me, but we will uh, also just have one or two more songs of worship um, after this. Uh, please do join us for that worship, and then also please join us for the Zoom call that takes place uh, after this sermon. Um, so let me pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you that um, you are bold, Lord, that when the devil tempted you, uh, in the wilderness that you were able to answer him uh, with words from your father. Uh, that when you are tested and tempted to um, be found wanting, that you are able to hold the line, King. That you call us to a high standard. That you uh, raise the bar of how we should address injustice. That you, in fact, um, love all people and that you want all people to have the sense of dignity that you give us when we follow you. Uh, thank you, Lord, that you uh, save us, that you change us, that you sanctify us, that you love us, that you set us free. Um, thank you, Lord, that we get to gather like this and still be in community. Um, and I pray, Lord, that for any engagement or interaction uh, that comes out of this uh, time with us here this evening, that it actually is a, a fruitful one where we can really overcome the problems. Um, and Lord, I pray for our world. I pray for our city and our country and for America and for the UK and parts of Africa and wherever else there is so much uh, prejudice centered around the fact that we are different from each other. I pray, Lord, that your hand will be there, that people will know you, uh, that they'll follow you, that they'll seek you, and that you will heal our lands, Lord. I pray all of this in Jesus' name because he died for our sins already. Um, yeah, amen.
so powerful, so beautiful. And Jesus, this is... Lord, thank you that you are with us. Jesus, we can echo the words of this song. We love you, Lord. Jesus, we love you. Thank you that you don't condemn us. You treat us all like the woman brought to you by the Pharisees. You say to each of us, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Thank you that you also help us, Lord. You don't just call us to this higher standard, Lord, but you walk with us. Thank you that you're with each of us. Thank you that you are changing our hearts. You've made our dead souls alive. Thank you that you've taken us from a place of darkness in a, into a place of light. Thank you that you continue this road with us. And thank you um, for, for this hope that you've set before us. That Michael's pointed us to this evening, Lord. Thank you that you bring us hope uh, in whatever situation and circumstance we find ourselves in at the moment. So we love you, Lord, and we ask you to bless each of us and to continue walking this road with us. In your mighty name, we, we close by saying amen. Everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, you know, obviously, we can't see you, but knowing that you are, are with us wherever you happen to be is a, is a great joy. Um, so I hope you have a great week. And please join us on the, the live Zoom link as I said, is on the Church of Main website and you should be able to find it below the YouTube video. Um, we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.